So, as I said last week, um, we have started a study through the book of Acts. Uh, We're going to be working through this book chapter by chapter to see the Lord establishing the church in order to build the kingdom of Christ. We're going to see the Lord establishing his church to build the kingdom of Christ. That's the overarching theme of this book. Uh, And in later chapters, uh, we're going to see the gospel march forward, spreading from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and eventually towards the ends of the earth. But in these opening chapters, we are seeing the church established and seeing how the church is preparing for this mission ahead. So last week, we explored the idea of preparing for God's purpose. This week, as we finish out chapter one, we're going to look at Christ's calling for the church. Specifically, we're going to look at who Christ calls, your response to his calling, and finally, what happens when your response is inadequate. So let me go ahead and read our text for this evening. Uh, Chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 12 through 26 and finish out the first chapter of Acts. Let me read. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers a group numbering about a hundred and twenty. And he said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called the field in their language, Akadelma, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership." Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. So beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barabbas, who also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. And then they cast lots, and the lots fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. So we are first going to look at who... Christ calls, right? Who does he use in order to establish the church and build his kingdom? And the short answer to that question is Christ calls the ordinary, not the extraordinary. If you remember last week, we talked about the term apostle. Uh, In Greek, it literally just means to be a sent out one, 
But who were these sent out ones that Jesus chose and called? In verse 13, you are provided with a list, excluding Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. There are 11 names that appear on this list. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. So who were these men? At least four of them, Andrew, Peter, James, and John, were poor fishermen. And and both Jewish and Roman society, uh, anyone who was a fisherman or a farmer or someone who was associated with uh, agriculture, they were considered to be pretty low on the social hierarchy. Now, aside from these fishermen, you also see Matthew, who was a tax collector, one of the, uh, the, the most despised occupations you could have during this time. Uh, they had a notorious reputation for being greedy and corrupt, and Jewish tax collectors in particular were seen as traitors by their fellow Jews. They were seen as impoverishing their own people all the while while the Romans profited from it. So you have four fishermen and a tax collector, and the only other apostle whose occupation we are given a glimpse of is that of Simon, otherwise known as Simon the Zealot. Now, we don't know a lot about Simon personally, but the Zealots were a political faction in the first century, which sought to liberate Judea from the rule of Rome. They were very militaristic in nature. So Simon, as he is associated with this party, was most likely a political revolutionary. So Jesus chose a rather motley crew of men to carry out his mission. Uh, You can see as you study these guys that they are not the cream of the crop. They're not NBA all-stars. They're not first-round draft picks for the NFL. Just the fact that they're even working in the professions that they are means that they were not next in line to become the religious elite of their day. They they weren't going to be rabbis. uh, They weren't going to be scholars. Uh, If you want a 21st century way of putting it, you could consider these men blue collar. And yet Jesus intentionally called them to act as his ambassadors to the nations. He could have chosen the brightest. Uh, He could have chosen those who were at the upper echelons of Roman and Jewish society and those who had great social influence. Yet he intentionally chose these outcasts instead. And just as he did in the first century, so too does the Lord continue to choose the ordinary to accomplish the extraordinary. The ordinary means by which God builds his church and grows his kingdom most often is not through kings or presidents or celebrities, Christ's kingdom advances via the prostitutes and the poor, via the voiceless and the weak. And so if you have ever looked at your life and thought that there is no way that the Lord could use you, then you should rejoice because that means that you are precisely the kind of individual the Lord most often 
does choose. So that is who Christ calls. We, we've answered that question. Secondly, this evening, I want to ask the question, how should you respond to that call? And, and to do that, I, I want to focus in on two apostles in particular. And we've already talked about the apostles as a whole. Now let us focus in specifically on Peter and Judas. In verse 15, we see Peter acting as the leader of a small group of men and women who make up the early followers of Jesus. You have about 120 individuals in total. And Peter is speaking about the fate of Judas. We're told that after he sold Jesus out to the religious leaders for 30 pieces of silver, he ends up buying a field with that money and he hangs himself. Now, Jesus handpicked both Peter and Judas. He chose both of these men to be his apostles. And now one of them is leading and preparing Jesus' followers to take the Gospels to the ends of the earth, and the other one is now dead. So let's take a moment and stop to think about how there could be such vastly different outcomes for these two men, especially in the reality that their lives were almost identical to one another. So both of these men were well-respected individuals. Peter was always the natural leader among the twelve, and Judas was trustworthy enough to be given the money bag. He, he oversaw all of the finances for the apostles. And despite that respect that each of these received from others, both of these men go on to betray Jesus in their own way. Judas sells him out for 30 pieces of silver, and Peter denies any association with him three times in a single night. And after their betrayals, both of these men experienced severe remorse for what they have done. When Peter hears the crow of the rooster, he goes out and he weeps bitterly. And so too does Judas. After he realizes what he has done, he runs back into the chief priests and he tries to give them back his silver, saying he has sinned by betraying innocent blood. So both of these men are very similar to one another. But there is a defining difference between the two that explains why one goes on to be a key leader in the early church, while the other one simply goes on to hang himself. The only real difference between Peter and Judas is that though both regretted their sins, Judas never let that regret lead to repentance. Both, both of them deeply regretted their sins, but Judas never let that regret lead to repentance. Peter made just as many mistakes as Judas. He was rash, he was stubborn, he was bullheaded, he denied Christ to save his own life, but Peter understood the proper response to sin didn't just end with mere regret. Peter repented after denying Jesus, and because of this, Christ restored Peter to his position again among the apostles. And similarly, if you too want to leave any kind of lasting impact for the kingdom of Christ, 
You too need to learn how to properly respond to sin as well. The mark of a mature believer is not just a reduction in the frequency of your sins, but it is rather learning how to properly respond to those sins, which inevitably will still remain in your life. As long as you live in a fallen, broken, sinful world, your life will never be completely free from sin. So you have to learn not to simply regret the mistakes that you make, but you must learn how to repent from them so that you are not destined to repeat those mistakes. So we have seen who the Lord calls and we have seen how you should respond to that call. Uh, Lastly, I want to take a look at what happens when your response is inadequate. What what happens when the Lord calls you to a task and you fail to live up to his expectations? The the last verse in this, the last verses in this chapter uh, show us what happens after Judas's demise. Uh, They show the process that the apostles go through in order to replace him. They still don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them. So instead, they use a a very Old Testament way of discerning the Lord's will. And they decide to cast lots to see who the Lord would choose. And the lot falls on Matthias, a man who has been with Jesus since uh, uh, his baptism all the way to the crucifixion. And so now, once again... The 12 apostles have been restored. There are, once again, 12 apostles. And through this process, you see what happens when you, like Judas, fail to live up to the expectations the Lord has called you to. You you see that despite your own inadequacies, the Lord's plan still prevails. Despite your own shortcomings and your own adequacies, uh, the Lord's plan still prevails. Your failures do not affect the future outcome of what God is doing. The the Lord knew that Judas would betray Jesus. Uh, Peter even quotes from Psalm 109, a passage written hundreds of years prior that foretold Judas's fate. But Judas's decisions to betray Jesus did not thwart the plan of God. The Lord restores the apostles back to 12. And just as there were 12 tribes that formed the nation of Israel, now too are there 12 men to form the nucleus of the church. There are 12 witnesses that can testify to the life of Christ and the reality that his arrival has redefined what it means to follow the Lord. No longer must you be a descendant of Abraham to be God's chosen. Now being a disciple of Christ becomes the gold standard for what it means to follow the Lord and to be a part of his people. So the Lord was still at work and his plans were still unfolding. But it would have been very easy for the apostles to not have had the foresight to see all of the different ways that the Lord was still at work. It would have been easy for them to let the discouragement of Judas's death cause them to believe that the advancement of the gospel had somehow been disrupted. To believe that his plans had somehow been paused and put on hold. Judas was a man who they had lived with and worked alongside for years. 
And they were absolutely blindsided by his betrayal of Jesus. And yet, the apostles still trust that the Lord's plans have not been thwarted. They recognize that losing a fellow apostle didn't prevent the progress of God's plan. It actually was a part of that plan in order that the scripture may be fulfilled. And so the apostles simply pray for the Lord to send them a replacement. And they recognize that God alone knows everyone's heart. And so in he alone should they trust to select another apostle. And as a follower of Christ, as a follower of Jesus, when you or those around you have failed to live up to the expectations of the Christian life, um, it can be difficult to trust in the Lord's continued plans and purposes. Maybe it's an egregious sin that was committed by a member of the church. Or or maybe there are tensions or division in the life of your family or in your marriage, or perhaps your reputation personally has been shattered as the result of your own sin. Whatever it is, there will inevitably be moments in the Christian life where you will wonder how the Lord could possibly work past such travesties. You you will wonder how the Lord could possibly move in the midst of this mess that that sin has created. But in moments like that, Rather than fixate on your own failures or the faults of others, just let me encourage you to simply trust the Lord and his triumph over the grave. Trust that if Judas's betrayal or or Peter's denial of Jesus, if they didn't prevent Jesus from defeating death, then no sin in your own life will ever stop the progress of the gospel either. No mistake on your part or on the part of others can muddle the mission of God. No no matter how much you fail, his plans will still prevail. The power of the gospel can still transform your life and conform you better into the image of Christ. And the Lord can still use your life to share the gospel with others, transforming them into the image of Christ as well. Even when your response to Christ's calling is inadequate, you can still trust in the prevailing power of God's transformative grace. So this evening... Uh, we have finished out chapter one of the book of Acts, and we've looked at the role and the ministry of the apostles. Uh, And and this office that was once instrumental in establishing the early church, uh, it's now a closed office that we no longer have in the modern context. Uh, You no longer have pastors, deacons, and apostles serving in the church. But even if we no longer have these men among us to testify to the life and the ministry of Christ, uh, it's my hope that, that you have seen this evening that God's word acts as its own witness to the gospel. God's word itself is a testament to the gospel. As we've studied these infallible words of scripture this evening, uh, and as we have been guided by the Holy Spirit as we've studied these words, uh, it's my hope that God has testified to you clearly of the calling that Christ has for you and for his church.
Even though you are not an apostle yourself, it's my prayer that through studying the lives of these apostles, you have clearly seen who Christ calls, how you should respond to that call, and what happens when that response is inadequate. The reality that the Lord's plans still prevail. Let me pray.